Thanks very much for the introduction. Thanks very much for the invitation. And as I know from being an old Hewitt School attendee, uh, really is remarkable that you're all here by uh, 10 to 10 in the morning. It certainly wasn't the case, I remember, in, in my day. Um, I mean, the, as the abstract for this uh, talk announced, the, the title inserts John Hewitt's preferred identity, or at least the bedrock of it, Ulsterman into Bernard Crick's celebrated essay on nationality and allegiance, an Englishman uh, considers his passport. But both the identity, I suppose, and the essay, when you read them, uh, now sound rather quaint. I mean, Hewitt's uh, Ulsterman, as he said, steeped in the traditions of this place, was once a common, but of course, a contentious uh, usage. For example, Seamus Heaney, uh, thought that using it would betray his identity. Just as suppose if he were to apply to a Unionist or a Protestant, the label Irish, he would feel rather uncomfortable with that, if not somehow qualified. And I suppose today the term Ulsterman is certainly heard less frequently and confined mainly to sport, uh, as for example the uh, Ulster rugby team, for whom I suppose we are supposed to stand up if you have any interest in the Union sort of rugby. Crick's essay appeared in the Irish Review of 1988, and his uh, passport uh, designated him, as he said, a citizen of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. But that designation, Crick argued, didn't sort out for him what he called the existential question that is, the question of the hotel register. That is, what's his nationality? And he had this to say about the Irish response uh, to the hotel register. He said this, when those with an address in Northern Ireland write British, one reasonably assumes that they are Protestant and Unionist. And a few with similar addresses boldly write Irish, and some of those even carry quite legally an Irish passport instead of, or as well as, a United Kingdom passport. Once or twice, says Crick, I've seen entries which slide around the question and write, citizen of the United Kingdom. And Crick assumed the latter had to be Alliance Party voters. <laughs> well, uh, times change. And the idea, I suppose, of signing an actual hotel register with the intimations or implications of Mr. and Mrs. Smith on an illicit weekend, well, that seems rather archaic now. But so too, I think, does the assumption that only nationalists would have an Irish passport. You remember after the EU referendum, Ian Paisley Jr.'s famous advice to his constituents. Look, if you wanted EU citizenship, just get an Irish passport. Well, this wonderful cartoon appeared shortly after. It's wonderful. Um, <laughs> yeah. but when I, but in my memory, I thought it was the woman who came in and said, Luke Cecil, our Irish passports have arrived just in time for the marching season. <laughs> but uh, they, that, that does the job pretty well. And as uh, Sammy Wilson uh, later confirmed to the House of Lords European Union uh, Select Committee, back to earlier this year, uh, unionist applications for Irish passports isn't just mere hearsay or wishful thinking. But in my own case, uh, in fact, it isn't you. Uh, from 1981 to 1991, I held an Irish passport as well as a British one. And the reason, the reason wasn't divided allegiance or confused identity, but it was instrumental calculation. At the time, I was doing quite a bit of uh, traveling across what then used to be known as the Iron Curtain. And I thought that, well, an Irish passport might make or could make things easier. I suppose maybe it did. I mean, the fact that I was never, ever approached by anyone from any of the East European security agencies, uh, never mind the KGB, to act as a spy, maybe uh, proof enough of the value of having an Irish passport <coughs> in those days. And of course, I'm loath to admit my own total and utter historic insignificance uh, for any security agency. 
But by uh, 1991, uh, and referring to the poetic theme of this year's uh, Hewitt Summer School, well, European borders, European allegiance had indeed shifted. Uh, the world appeared to have changed, to have changed utterly. And if you recall, the end of history in 1989, 1990 was actually proclaimed. And even my old uh, politics tutor at Queen's University, Michael Cox, or Mick Cox as he's better known, argued in a quite celebrated article, which was published at the time, Northern Ireland, the war that came in from the cold. In other words, the argument that the peace process in Northern Ireland was also very much related to that change, or indeed a product of that broader change that was happening ideologically politically and territorially in Europe. So here was both a, a literal and an ideological frontier crossing. The fall of the Berlin Wall, German reunification, and shortly following that, and as a consequence of it, the Treaty on European Union signed in Maastricht in 1992. So assumed at the time, as many people did, well, things had changed for good. Two passports were now redundant. And just so you think I'm not making it up, here is that old passport that I was able to uh, dig out. It's a, an historical artifact now. But the change from that old format to this new format was a common one. And it coincided with events just mentioned. And as you can see, I took Ian Paisley Jr.'s advice. And indeed, whenever uh, this passport arrived, I thought that in the spirit of that Banks cartoon, well, there must be a joker in the Irish passport office in Dublin, because mine arrived on the 11th of July. <laughs> <laughs> Bonfire night. So when I consider this old passport, Hume's poem, the Hume's uh, uh, poem The Frontier, which uh, was up at the beginning. Those lines about small men in uniform, the thumbing of passports, bracing for change. Well, it all sounds very familiar and brought back memories. And when I look at the rather sort of copious uh, border stamps and visas in this old passport, reading it and looking back on it, it was like reading once again uh, that story of Europe, Europe's recent history and changing experience. So the theme of the, the lecture is simply to go through this passport and try to conjure up the changes that have taken place. There's a stamp dated 1981, and it reads Wien Schreckert, and Wien Schreckert, you probably know, is Vienna's international airport. And one of uh, Prince Metternich one of Castle Ray's, uh, three of his colleagues at the sort of post-Napoleon uh, Europe, Prince Metternich, one of his celebrated remarks was, Asia begins at the Landstrasse. And this is Metternich's summer house in Vienna on the Landstrasse, a photograph uh, taken by 1850. Now Metternich called that frontier, the frontier of civilization. I mean, that was partly a jest, of course. He was partly making a joke. But if you may remember that there was a, a Cold War saying in Berlin up until 1989, which sort of echoes Metternich's saying that there's something fundamental happens just down the road. And it was Siberia begins a checkpoint, Charlie. In other words, there's somewhere very different in Europe that isn't really us. And in 1981, when I first went uh, to uh, uh, Vienna, it really did feel that a different world began at the Landstrasse. I mean, I saw signs for Budapest, Bratislava, and Prague, that other ideological East or Asia, which was the product and bequeathed by the settlement at Yalta, in 1945. Now at the time I knew very little about Vienna, nor did I know very much about Austria 
But what I very quickly learned uh, was a lesson in shifting borders and changing allegiances. Vienna, the city, had lost its empire after 1918 and its hinterland after 1945. And Vienna at the time, it seemed to me, was a city living on nostalgia, living on the romance of the old Habsburg dynasty, and not just for tourist reasons, but there was that atmosphere about the place. But it was a romance, and it was romantic, so long as you didn't look too closely at the history, of course. Maybe that's the same everywhere. And the Chancellor of Austria at the time, the Socialist, or Social Democratic, Chancellor of Austria at the time was Bruno Kreisky. His name may sound familiar to you. And even he, as an old socialist, lamented the parting, the disappearance of the empire. And he lamented it because it hadn't survived as a supranational community in Central Europe, nationally diverse, but retaining its basic unity. In that regard, then, Vienna had the feeling of a melancholic city, simply because that mythic old order had gone, and it appeared to have gone for good. It did seem to be a city condemned to provincialism. And one of the very big uh, exhibitions at the time, massively popular in Vienna, was the one I've just shown. It, it began in 1985, made a big impact, not only in Austria, but throughout, throughout Europe in the products that were produced there. And it's um, an exhibition called, as you can see, a Traum und Wirklichkeit, or Dream and reality, and I think it's, it was very well put, the and rather than the or, because the dream and the idea and the reality are mixed, I suppose as they are, in any understanding of national history or even national vocation. And really what that exhibition was claiming was at a point in its history that, in a sense, Vienna invented the modern world, or Vienna was the center of the making of the modern world. But what was that romantic Austrian myth? How could you put it into to words? Well, you may know here perhaps better um, Hugo von Hofmannsthal. You may know him better as the librettist for Richard Strauss's The Rosenkavalier. But von Hofmannsthal was also the advocate of what that book claims there a certain Austrian idea of Europe, a certain Austrian idea of Europe. And coincidentally, von Hofmannsthal was born on the Landstrasse that Metternich talked of. Now, in 1917, nearly towards the end of the First World War, von Hofmannsthal put it like this. He said, what is that Austrian idea? He said, it is to be at once border march border wall and settlement between the European empire and always chaotically moving mixture of peoples cramped before its gates, half Europe, and with reference to Metternich here, half Asia, and at the same time a flowing border, a point of departure for colonization, for penetration, with cultural waves propagating east towards the east but also receiving and ready to receive the counterwave striving westward. Now that rosy view of the benign coexistence of peoples and cultures, the absorption and accommodation of difference in the Habsburg Empire, albeit of course with the Germans playing the leading role, I mean that seemed forced in 1917. It seemed an illusion, it seemed simply an idea in 1917. Well, in 1918, that empire and that world was gone. The Austro-Hungarian Empire collapsed. And the original tele-historian, I mean, there's now numbers of tele-historians, but the original tele-historian who made his career really writing about uh, Austro, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the, the Habsburgs, was A.G.P. Taylor. You may remember him. 
And A.G.P. Taylor's judgment on that story, that myth, or that idea was nothing other than cruel. A.G.P. Taylor said only poets could be stupid enough to imagine the Habsburg Empire as a device for enabling a number of nationalities to live together. So it was a nonsense. A.G.P. Taylor chose to call the Austro-Hungarian Empire a vast collection of Ireland's. And by that he meant it was a state permanently in crisis. And if you want to um, sort of follow that argument through by someone who had a, a monstrous impact on European uh, history shortly afterwards, just read the first chapters of Hitler's Mein Kampf, where Hitler makes exactly the same judgment of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So after its collapse, frontiers went up everywhere in Europe, in Central Europe, in the name of national self-determination, as they did here in Ireland. And Hewitt's small men in uniform, albeit in different uniforms, they appeared in force. And for those uh, who had lived, or still lived, in former Habsburg territories, who were suddenly to experience ethnic nationalism, then to experience Nazism, and then to experience Soviet communism, was it any wonder then a romance of the past lingered, even if it was only confined to the old coffee houses, even if it was only confined uh, to literature or to poetry? I'll take two uh, chroniclers of change after World War I, Joseph Roth and Stefan Zweig. They may be uh, familiar to you. In Roth's novels, uh, one finds that mixture of nostalgia and melancholy that I was talking about, that nostalgia and melancholy for a, a lost world, but also a horror for the world that was coming into being. For Roth, it was a world of ethnic exclusiveness, it was a world of ethnic exclusion, and it was a world with no place for people like him. Equally, Stefan Zweig's very celebrated and still um, popularly read novel, The World of uh, uh, Memoir, Memoir, The World of Yesterday. It evokes, like Hoffman style, an idea of Europe out of Austrian experience. And his words, written then, uh, could be taken from a speech by Emmanuel Macron today. This is how he put it. He said, the European idea is not a primary emotion like patriotism or ethnicity. It is not born of a primitive instinct, but rather of perception, an idea. It is not the product of spontaneous fervor, but the slow ripened fruit of a more elevated way of thinking. I mean, to use David Goodhart's uh, terms that have come into the political vocabulary today, after 1918, the collapse of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Roth and Zweig had become anywheres who had lost their somewhere. Their somewhere had been appropriated by someone else. Both died in exile, Roth of drink in Paris, Zweig of suicide in Brazil, and of that one is tempted to say an epitaph for an idea. But that idea has been tenacious in the European imagination and is still powerful today, translated into the, uh, the European idea. Take, for example, a book which made a big impact in, 1980s, in the 1980s, particularly in Ireland and particularly in the Hewitt Summer School, if I remember. And that book was Claudio Magri's Danube, on the left, and then subsequently uh, the publication of his book, Microcosms. And like the meandering course of the Danube, what Magri explored is the diverse currents of Central European, or indeed European, civilization. And the appeal of that book <clears throat> was obvious here, Indeed, 
as elsewhere. Even though he lingered on worlds that had gone, he did give hope that things could change. And I've always put it when reading his books, in short, that eventually life would overcome ideology. This was the world of the Cold War. People beyond the Landstrasse, uh, people in the Siberia beyond Checkpoint Charlie, they wanted that, that's clear. People here at the time wanted that. But then it just didn't seem possible. It just didn't seem possible to imagine oneself out of uh, the situation, out of the troubles here or the Cold War in Europe. Now, Magri described that old myth of that old idea of Hoffmannsthal, of Zweig, of Roth, in this way. He described it as an art of flight, waiting for a country forever sought and foreseen, but never known. Vienna, he described as a crossroads, a place of departures and returns. And you can see the recurrence of that notion from Hoffmannsthal as well. But he also said it's a place where history gathers together and then disperses. And that's how I sensed uh, the city in the 1980s, waiting for history to gather itself again. And if Magree felt at home in that world, well, maybe it's because he himself is a citizen of Trieste. Joyce's, James Joyce's old haunt, Trieste itself, it knows very well the shifting borders and shifting allegiances of that part of the world. So frontiers are lines on maps, yes, but they are also acts of political will in the minds of men, as the historian, the Irish historian J.C. Beckett wrote in 1966. And reading uh, Hewitt's poem, The Frontier Today, in the light of Magri's books in the 1980s, well, one can detect certainly a kindred spirit. There's a kindred spirit here. Magri's uh, reflection that no frontier is ever final also replicates Hewitt's implicit poetic appeal. This is how Magri puts it, and I think it is implied in what uh, Hewitt had to write. He says this, Perhaps the only way to neutralise the lethal power of borders is to consider oneself and to put oneself on the other side forever. And that's a, an act of the imagination, even more important, I suppose, when the mental border just doesn't run between communities, but runs within them. Not between territories, but within territory. And then, remarkably, with all my study of politics and all my reading of politics in the 1980s, did I foresee this happening? No. I didn't, <laughs> From, but remarkably, after 1988, change did happen, and it changed more suddenly than anyone could ever have imagined. A new country did appear. Austria became a member of the European Union. Vienna recovered its old hinterland, if not its empire. The frontier to Asia opened up again. And revisiting the city uh, recently, my first thought, my first thought was this. Vienna today would be more familiar to Hoffmannsthal, to Roth, to Zweig, than it would have been, than the Vienna would have been to me in the 1980s. Change was dramatic. Here appeared was that idea that they'd all talked about. Sought, foreseen, but now it's known. It's happened. And as you can see, Austria today holds the, uh, the presidency of the, of the European Union and has placed itself right back at the centre uh, of Europe. And on the right, you can see uh, Sebastian Kurz, uh, the new Chancellor of uh, Austria, uh, meeting the... Uh, What is he? The president of the of the European uh, Commission, and again the very disturbing thing for somebody of my age that Kurtz is only thirty one, and uh, he wasn't even born uh, when I first visited uh, 
visited Vienna. So Austria, now as you can see, in the center, but holding together, it would see both east and west. That was my first thought. My second thought was this. Vienna had a new Alain. Austria had a new role in Europe. However, the old problems that the, the myth had suppressed, ethnic animosities, racial tensions, religious segregation, well, they'd returned. Frontiers, again, are at the heart of Vienna's diplomacy. The Austrian interior minister, who comes not from Kurtz's party, but from the coalition party, the, uh, the uh, Freedom Party of Austria, the Austrian interior minister recently announced a strategy called pro-borders. And he declared very firmly that a state that can't protect its borders effectively loses its credibility. Now, last year, a book that some of you may have read, Ivan Krastev's book, After Europe, Krastev argued that the migration crisis in Europe reignites an older imaginative split. And it is between Zweig's primary emotion, nationalism, and that elevated way of thinking, or cosmopolitanism, or the European idea. But what struck me about Krastev's book, whether you agree with the argument or not, was that his conclusion has a very familiar historical echo. And it's this. He concluded by saying, well, despite all these problems that Europe has, he said, the EU's strength, the European Union's strength, alone is its capacity to survive. And why is that familiar? Well, that was the judgment of the Habsburg Empire before it collapsed. In other words, we should never take things as they seem or as they appear because the inevitable, in retrospect, may not have been predicted at the time. And those who visit uh, Vienna know that a, a popular museum exhibition concerns the defeat of the Turks in the famous siege of Vienna in 1683. And that sense of siege has returned. To paraphrase von Hofmannsthal, a border wall is now imagined. A border wall imagined against a, co co a chaotically moving mixture of peoples camp for its gates, but preventing the wave from striving westwards. And of course, it's not just Austria. How does one explain this? Well, consider another set of stamps in this old passport. There, there are three of them that are linked together. Turl Maglern, Kokao, and Radici. Why? Why is this important? Well, throughout the 1980s, uh, I spent a lot of time in a little uh, village in Austria called Turl Maglern, which is directly on the Italian border at Kokao. <coughs> Drive over that border for a few miles, and you reach Radice which was then in Yugoslavia, which no longer exists, now in Slovenia. And the local name for that alpine region is the Dreilenderek, or Three Country Corner. Now, it felt very cosmopolitan to me to have my breakfast in Austria, which wasn't in the then European communities and was a neutral state, to have lunch in Italy, which was in the European communities and a NATO state, dinner in Yugoslavia, which is communist, but non-aligned, and then back home before bedtime. And in terms of Hewitt's poet, The Frontier, yes, in each place were new postage stamps, different prices, and manifestos. And the cultural changes were also obvious. Drink beer in Austria, wine in Italy, schnapps in Sylvania, I was advised, and it was very good advice. And the landscape, like Hewitt's poem, didn't alter either. You were always in these mountains. The mountains were the same. All three were formerly part of the Habsburg Empire, ethnically mixed. But war and frontiers had made each part of them ethnically homogenous, though uh, relationships are good. On the left there is that the old border checkpoints in between Austria and Italy, looking from Italy into Austria, and on the right, now the new tourist trail that takes you right around that dry land, Slovenia, Austria, 
and, uh, and Friuli or uh, Italy. The region now designates itself Alpen Adria. Old borders have become, to use the current jargon, frictionless. No one mans the old posts. Unfortunately, no more stamps. All three are in the EU and Schengen. And when I was there last, I saw a new book written about that region with the wonderful subtitle Zwei Flüsse, Drei Kulturen, Vier Sprachen. Three rivers, two, sorry, two rivers, three cultures, four languages. And the fourth language being the local dialect in Italy, Afruelan. Very Habsburgian indeed. Now, Maigret at the time thought that borders are a need, a fever, and a curse. In Alpa and Adria, the borders remain, the stamps, the prices, the manifestos remain, but they're no longer a curse, at least for residents and for tourists like me, but not so for migrants, because a fevered concern has returned, and it is that fear of invasion at the gates. How do you explain it? Well, here's my explanation from my own uh, experience. In the 1980s, in that little village in Terrell Magdalen, standing in the railway station, I recall waiting for a local train. And I looked at its very impressive timetable, massive timetable for this small little village. And I calculated that with one or two changes, I could be in Belgrade, in Prague, in Warsaw, in Budapest, in Zagreb. And as an island dweller, you can imagine, this all sounded marvelous. How wonderful this could be. And then there was a, a moment of epiphany. And I realized also then, well, people from there can also get here. And they can possibly come with an army. And at that point, much of European history suddenly made sense. Because for me, what I was enjoying living there was that sort of multicultural experience as a, an array of wonderfully open cultural goods. And yet, between 1915 and 1918, one million Italian, over one million Italian and Austrian troops died fighting in that territory. You can see how difficult that terrain was. Between 1940 and 1945, these mountains were the scene of fierce and bitter conflict between the Nazis and the Yugoslav partisans. Now, of course, the grand objective of European integration has been to remove borders, but by removing the fear of invasion. It's been one of its great objectives, not alone, of course, but with the protection of NATO. But recently, that objective has also become part of the problem. With the migrant crisis falling under military signing objectives like closing off the Balkan route. And that photograph there is from the Spielfeld border between uh, Austria or even the region I was living in and Slovenia. And interestingly, the person responsible for putting up the wire, closing off that border, closing off the migrant route through the Balkan was none other than the present Chancellor, Sebastian Kurz. Now some doubt that this is a crisis given the falling numbers of asylum seekers. Perhaps that's true. But I think the fear can be explained by a much older tension between East and West, a one that long predates Yalta and it is our old friend the German problem. Now, in the post-war revi revision of his history of the Habsburg monarchy, A.G.P. Taylor argued that if Russia withdrew from Europe, the result would be the restoration of German hegemony. And what he thought was that the states of Central Europe could only exist as independent nations in a German system. Now, as we know, European integration was designed to solve that very problem, designed to solve the German problem. But in 2015, Angela Merkel's unilateral decision on migrants, however much 
motivated by genuine humanitarian concern, and it was a real humanitarian concern, revived deep historical concerns in Central Europe, especially in those states formerly dominated by Soviet Russia. And let's just consider two of them. In Hewitt's poem, the train from France to Switzerland slows to a stop at the frontier. Uniformed officials drift down the corridor inspecting documents. Customs officers chalk the bags, but leave the passengers to shut them. Travelling across Central Europe, never mind from France into Switzerland, travelling across Central Europe and travelling across that former ideological border, the old, cold, uh, the old um, Cold War border of the Iron Curtain, was even more intrusive than that. Because I have in the old passport a visa for Czechoslovakia. And the border stamp is for Breklav, and it's dated 1984. But the train from Vienna doesn't, didn't stop at the border. It stopped in no man's land. Iron gates closed behind it. Alongside in those old corridor carriages that Hugh talks about in his poem, armed guards patrolled with fierce dogs. The first men in uniform to enter your compartment searched under the seats and above in the luggage racks. The second checked your passport and visa. The third went through your bags thoroughly and left you to shut them. But there was a fourth, and that fourth uniformed official arrived with two armed companions, and his job was to exchange your currency. You had to exchange good Austrian shilling at the time for worthless corona. And I may have misremembered, but in my memory, you had to change from one to one. But what I do remember thinking was, here is the state operating very clearly as a protection racket. There isn't any velvet glove. It's just the iron fist. And that wasn't a good impression. And my impression of Prague, when we got there, was even worse. Now, Prague today, with the EasyJet connection, as you know, is the stag and Hindu capital of Europe for partying Irish and, and uh, <laughs> British youth. But then it was drab, claustrophobic, and as Vaclav Havel described it, demoralized by the failed Prague Spring of 1968. And if Vienna appeared to be, in my mind at least, waiting for times to change, Prague appeared to have given up hope resides to cultural and political suffocation. You really did have the impression that, well, Siberia may not begin at Checkpoint Charlie, but it began uh, on the Czech border. Now, of course, 1989, things changed again. The photograph on the, the, right, on the left is the memorial to Jan Palach, I don't know whether people remember, I, I remember him very well because it was in 1968. He was the student that set himself alight on fire, killed himself in protest at the Russian, uh, the Soviet invasion in 1968. I remember that making a big impact on me. I wrote one of my drivelly poems about <laughs> Jan Palach and in memory of him. And then on the right, Vaclav Havel, in a sense, entering into his literary uh, ideal and emotional inheritance, political inheritance, in 1989, addressing uh, the people in Wenceslas Square. And of course, today, Czechoslovakia, a successor state to the Habsburg Empire, no longer exists. Like Yugoslavia, originally the kingdom of the Serbs, the Croats and the Slovenes, has split into its national parts. But at least in Czechoslovakia, it did so peacefully. Borders go, the borders also appear. In 1993, Timothy Gordon Ash asked, can Central Europe be put together again at the very point where it is most often being divided? In other words, can it avoid that clash of populisms which once produced that vast collection of islands? Well, today, beyond the Landstrasse, we have the Visegrad Four. Poland, Czech Republic, Slovakia, and Hungary. Austria is on the edge of that Visegrad Four. As ever, Austria is pulled west, 
and pulled east. As a, another famous uh, Austrian writer, Gregor von Rizzori, once put it, he said, whenever he was in the west, he felt east. Whenever he was in the east, he felt west. And Austria is pulled in both those ways. But what the Visegrad for, and even today Austria, and as it spreads, Italy, perhaps Sweden as well, it's their collectively populist position which we tend to identify it with. Not the liberal idea of Europe that many dreamed of in the 1980s. Like the Croatian author on the right, Slavanka Draculic, wonderful uh, book, Café Europa, Café Europa with Europe. Imagine that this cafe where people would uh, drink their coffees, sharing the same tables. Where the EU in that book was just as much a mythic place, just as much a place of romance as the old Habsburg Empire. Now, how that east-west split or even north-south split in the EU plays out, we cannot say. Uh, I didn't imagine change in the 1980s when I was there, and I'm not prepared to uh, predict any change today. I just simply don't know. But what of that other part of the uh, Habsburg Empire Hungary. Well, I have a number of visas in the old uh, uh, passport, uh, mainly for journeys to Budapest. But there's one stamp uh, which is, is worth remarking on, and it's stamped Kupasa, and it's dated 1988. And it's a border post near Sopron, and Kupasa and Sopron today probably don't suggest places of world historic significance are having an important role in the transformation of European frontiers. And yet they were. In 1989, Hungary had a different migrant problem. It wasn't migrants coming up from Syria or migrants coming from Afghanistan, the Middle East. Those migrants were German. The liberalizing policy in Hungary at the time in the old Eastern Bloc provided a refuge for thousands of East Germans who saw an opportunity, a potential opportunity, to escape to the West. And in August of 1989, Sopron was the venue for the so-called Pan-European Picnic. And the Pan-European Picnic was held there to symbolize the free transit of peoples, not the actual transit, but the free transit of peoples between East and West. And here's a delicious historical irony about that picnic. One of the organizers was Otto von Habsburg, the son of the last emperor of Europe. And there's also a local connection here. The year before, in the European Parliament, Otto von Habsburg had a punch-up with one of our local representatives at the time the Reverend Ian Paisley, who was protesting in the European Parliament the um, appearance of Pope John Paul II, who was speaking to the Assembly. There's the invitation to the picnic on the left. There on the right is around some of the 600 East, Europe East Germans who crossed the border at Kupasa. It was left open. A few months later, about 10,000 East Germans took the route through Austria into then West Germany. So <clears throat> we tend to think of the, the breakup of that old order being the fall of the Berlin Wall in November. But what happened in Hungary proved that the game was up for the East German regime. And it seemed on that border that Otto von Habsburg's vision of borderless Europe had come into existence, had been reborn between Austria and Hungary. How ironic. But fast forward 30 years, and there's another irony. I mentioned um, before Timothy Garden Ash, one of the best eyewitness accounts, very famous and very readable today, eyewitness accounts of the events of 1989, is Timothy Garden Ash's book, We the People. And Garton Ash introduces in that book a very important personage. He introduces 
Viktor Orban as the liberal future of Hungary and of Central Europe. That's Orban on the left. Orban is now prime minister of Hungary, but he's no longer the liberal hero of, of Garden Ash. And Orban's uh, spokesman argued recently, Hungary considers migration a matter of national security, and we take seriously our obligations to protect the border. No form of asylum tourism is acceptable. And the formulation of Orban's position, as well as many of the positions within the Visegrad Four, is now defined as not liberal democracy, but as illiberal democracy, another way of describing populism. And of course, that is a European mood with a very clear Brexit echo. Borders require control. But where should those borders be? So let me conclude uh, in this way by bringing it back home, if you like, but home with a larger perspective. In 2017, Seamus Heaney thought that the world had become a big Ulster. An obvious exaggeration, but you can see what he meant. Because in the 1980s, I can remember, and probably you can remember, that the problem of politics in Northern Ireland, it used to be said, was that it was dominated by the border, by terrorism, and by the politics of identity. And yet today, the EU polling organization Eurobarometer shows that consistently the two most important issues for people in Europe, right across Europe, are borders and security, migration and terrorism. And as a recent Chatham House publication has argued, Chatham House, the most liberal of uh, sort of UK uh, European supporting institutions, it argues that central to Europe's agenda today is identity politics. And to us, of course, that sounds very familiar. And who would have thought two years ago that the Irish border would be at the heart of European politics? Because given all the crises attending borders elsewhere in continental Europe, even at Calais, for instance, Ireland is a model of a frictionless border. The Irish border exists, of course, but it's mainly been a crossing, for good or ill, rather than a barrier. And even that border, which was really the subtext of Hewitt's poem, The Frontier, the border in the mind, J.C. Beckett's border in the mind, that appeared to have been crossed too. For unionists, north-south institutions, a former obsession, sort of fallen off the political radar for most people. And for nationalists in Northern Ireland, the border appeared to have disappeared out of the island. And if the field day idea of the fifth province, or John Hume's idea of an agreed Ireland, had any imaginative relevance outside nationalist voters, well, it was here. People didn't talk about the border any longer. But of course, the result of the EU referendum in 2016 changed all that. And last year, Hewitt's poem, The Frontier, returned in the form of an anti-Brexit polemic in the Irish Times by the celebrated and liberal journalist Fitton O'Toole. And he argued that what we take for granted is always subject to the capriciousness of history, or you might say the capriciousness of democracy. Security, stability, and order aren't natural. Unlike the landscape in Hewitt's poem, they're not natural. They're an artifice or a creation of politics. And when politics, local, European, and global, or American, seem out of joint, it is very easy to fall into despair. Now take, for instance, uh, a recent report which really struck me very forcefully in, the, in Der Spiegel. And it was a report about Angela Merkel's current mindset, her mentality. Apocalypse Angie was what the sub-editor put it. And apparently, I, I didn't know this, but Angela Merkel now frequently refers in great European summits to the Peace of Augsburg, 
of 1555. Why? Well, that treaty established, and perhaps there's a local hint, a modus vivendi between Protestants and Catholics. It was the end of history in its own time. But as Angela Merkel uh, reminds her interlocutors, half a century later, and the Thirty Years' War would devastate large parts of Germany and Central Europe. So if we set aside a literal reading, the moral of that story is that our own order, our own old order, however you would define it, can fall apart too. Not because it's intended, not by design, but for no good reason, for all sorts of miscalculations. And that's the theme, if you're listening to it, of Margaret Macmillan's current brief lectures. As she said, for most, of, most people of her generation since 1945, broadly, we've experienced the long peace, but we fear it may be coming to an end. Now, Krastev has a very interesting way of describing that. He calls it the déjà vu mindset, that people today broadly, at least the intelligentsia perhaps, people like yourself, are haunted by the conviction that we are experiencing a repetition of a previous historical moment. As Frau Merkel looks back to the 17th century, most journalists seem to talk about the 1930s. I tend to think always about the last year of the Habsburg Empire. So that Euro European narrative of change, like from that old passport to the sort of common passport, was one of resolving the discrepancy between what exists, division, and what might be cooperation, and it has been generally positive. But today, I think, but is much less confident of that story. And I'll finish with another Austrian, and it's the Austrian satirist Karl Kraus. And Karl Kraus once joked that it's difficult to translate practice into an idea. So the other we tend to think it's difficult to translate an idea into practice. His joke was it's difficult to translate practice into an idea. But he has a point when we consider the problems that we face today. We need, I think, in all the practical details about borders, about how to cope with migrants, how to issue passports, how to deal with divisions. What we really need is an idea of civilized relations, whatever that idea may be, that can soften the, dis the divisions that we've inherited and the divisions that we may see coming down the road. Thank you.